All right, I'm going to bring us back from break now. So thank you for your attention. For our next speaker, we have Dr. Ryan Jarrett. Oops, sorry, give everybody a minute. For our next speaker, we have Dr. Ryan Jarrett. He completed his PhD in biostatistics from Vanderbilt in 2021. Subsequently completed a Fogarty Global Health Fellowship on design and analysis of early phase trials for preventative tuberculosis treatment among individuals living with HIV. And he's currently an advisor in global PKPD and, pharm and pharmacometrics at Eli Lilly, where his work is primarily focused on advancing treatments for COVID-19 and diabetes through early phase trials. So let's give our attention to Dr. Ryan Jarrett. Thank you. Better? Okay, there we go. Yeah, I'll try to not speak too loud now. Um, just I've been dealing with uh, technical difficulties, so hopefully everything will go smoothly now. But um, okay, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, pharmacometric modeling of COVID-19 monoclonal antibodies. This may be a little bit of an unusual talk. I was initially focusing on the, the modeling part itself, but that's not really where the, the interesting part is. And so it's shifted into a bit more of a tutorial because the, the, really, the more interesting part of this is kind of the infrastructure that we built around this to make it a streamlined process to quickly identify doses and to share the results with people who needed to see it. So um, I'd also be happy to take any clarifying questions throughout. If there are any, there will should be time towards the end. Um, uh, the talk is also going to be reasonably technical, I think. Uh, I will be walking through code at various points. So it, it's not essential that everyone follows everything. I think it's more important to, to see what, what can be done. But however, if you'd like to access any of it or follow along or tinker around with any of this in the future, the entire slides and all the generated, the code that is required to generate it is available on GitHub. I can come back to this uh, slide after the presentation if people would like. Um, okay, so to start with, Lily has developed several mon monoclonal antibodies for COVID-19 previously um, for treatment and prevention. And, uh, in general, we're interested in selecting candidates for uh, candidate monoclonal antibodies, and it occurs under a generally a very fast timeline. Um, yeah, okay. Um, and in general, our, our goal is going to be to incorporate whatever prior information we have, uh, all the uncertainty in it, and put it into a streamlined process for dose selection. Okay. So, right, Lily has introduced, uh, uh, had a number of uh, monoclonal antibodies authorized previously. Uh, BAM, Eddy, and BEB are the three here. And when they were introduced, uh, pharmacometric modeling played a fairly large role within it. And so for anyone who's interested, you can look at these two reference papers uh, that describe a lot of uh, Lily's work within it. Um, however, if you read the details of, of all this text under there, you'll note that none of the antibodies are currently effective. And the reason for this is that COVID-19 mutates at a fairly rapid rate and monoclonal antibodies are quite specific in their binding to targets. And so this makes developing any sort of medication that's going to stay useful for a long time quite difficult and also accelerates the need for really rapid development and introduction of um, of antibodies. Okay, so the effort that I'm going to be talking about is not linked to any of these. It's linked to more recent uh, efforts within this last year. And so as of uh, you know, late 2022, early 2023, the landscape of COVID had changed pretty substantially. Uh, we had uh, fairly effective treatments for it, and we had fairly effective vaccines for it. So the, the target clinical 
uh, the, the, the need clinically is for those who cannot receive the vaccines because, or, or else either cannot receive them for medical reasons or receive them, but aren't, don't, don't uh, levy good immune responses to it because of uh, immunocompromised status. And for them, you know, even as we go back to having things in person, life continues very much as it was in very early days when they had very little protection against COVID. Okay, so the goal in general is to identify new antibodies for prevention of COVID-19 and specifically within this target group of immunocompromised uh, individuals. Okay, so quick recap, antibodies. Uh, antibodies are going to bind to the spike protein of the COVID virus here, which is, uh, and so by binding to the spike protein of the virus, it prevents the virus from uh, connecting to cells, receptors on the cells, uh, and depositing the viral DNA within it. Um, as we said, uh, monoclonal antibodies tend to have highly specific binding, and we identify them typically by uh, isolating antibodies within convalescent individuals who have had immune system responses to them, and then isolating ones. Um, this here is a diagram of the spike protein of COVID-19, and colored in is the specific regions that antibodies tend to bind to the spike protein. So you can see they tend almost, almost exclusively to bind to this receptor binding domain here, uh, which unfortunately is the one of the regions that mutates quite frequently, quite quickly, right? And in no small part because there is so much immune pressure for it to mutate. However, not all uh, antibodies do bind to this part. And so there is interest certainly in antibodies that bind to other areas that don't mutate quite as rapidly. Um, or else finding combinations of antibodies that are going to bind to multiple places so that if one area mutates such and renders one of the antibodies uh, ineffective, then the other one would still be ineffective. Okay. From a PKPD modeling perspective, we are interested in identifying uh, monoclonal antibodies that have high activity against COVID. Specifically, we're then going to modify the antibodies with this YTE mutation that was originally noted in 2013 that extends the half-life of antibodies uh, roughly two to four times to give them a half-life around 100 days. And so this really is what is enabling the idea of preventative monoclonal antibodies that can be given somewhat infrequently. So I, we'll, we'll be looking at potentially at six month dosing intervals. Um, we want to develop a PKPD model that encompasses whatever prior information we have. Um, and so this will include uncertainty about the parameters, but also any measurement variability that we might observe within, within our lab assays. Uh, and then we're going to calculate the dose required to maintain efficacy for one year. And so traditionally, we've looked at efficacy from a PK standpoint, where we want to sustain concentrations greater than the IC90 uh, for one year in 90% of the patients. So this is one of the criteria that you could use. Um, however, we are interested in evaluating many antibodies, potentially, and for each antibody, we want to know how it does against many different viral variants. And so we're going to be going through this, uh, this calculation process many times. Okay, so PK modeling approach, we kind of assume out of the gate that monoclonal antibody disposition is going to be well described by a two compartment model. There's good reason to believe this. Uh, antibodies tend to be, and with the prior antibodies developed by Lilly, they are well described by two compartment models. So we kind of took this as a given. Um, and so we're going to walk through some R code. So here we're just generating a population of individuals. Uh, and I've set it to just be 50 within this case. So again, the, the goal here is to provide a template that uh, anyone can use to walk forward, to, to kind of play around with 
replicate the entire thing. Um, okay, and this is what our data look like. Okay, to uh, implement the model, we're using ArcsODE. Uh, sorry to all the Metrum folks. Um, but th this is how you would implement it within the, the set of ODEs. I don't think there's anything particularly surprising to anyone here. Uh, we're also writing a function here to predict the responses. So this is just taking in dose and a number of time points and returning the predicted output. We're also going to be interested in summarizing the output. We, we want to know what the median prediction is. We want to know what the upper and lower bounds, so specifically looking at 80% prediction intervals, so 10th and 90th percentiles are what are going to be calculated by default. And we're going to be interested in plotting our results at some point. So putting that all together, we can run a line of code here to say predict a response at one gram uh, for 180 days, and right, and so as we said, right, our, our concentrations above this threshold, let's say it's of 40 uh, micrograms per milliliter at six months, and so we could go and iteratively try different doses, right, plug in different things and see what dose is going to give us the value that results in keeping everyone above this threshold. However, that is time consuming. And again, if we have to do this many, many times, it's uh, frustrating. So what we can do instead is directly optimize what we're looking at uh, uh, maintaining. So in this case, our FPC criteria is maintaining IC90 concentrations in 90% of patients at six months. And so we can define a function that returns uh, the location or the, the value of the 10th percentile at 180 days and the distance between that and the uh, the IC90 estimate right so just going back to the picture when this lower bound here is meeting this line here then that means we have met our criteria right and so we can define a function that just returns that value and then um, so we'd write this something like this, right? Our objective function is some function of dose, and we're going to return the 10th percentile of concentrations at 180 days, and then the distance of that from the IC90, okay? And so intuitively, when this function returns zero, then we have our optimal dose according to this criterion. So implemented in R, this is what it looks like. We start by inputting a dose, uh, we might have a different, uh, we want to be adaptive to number of, uh, to our dosing interval, so we might have additional doses. We have a function that's going to predict our response and calculate the 10th percentile, and then we return the distance between that and the target, right? And so running that, we can simply pass this into an optimizer that tells us, okay, well, the dose that you needed to maintain this criterion is uh, 1,775 uh, milligrams, right? And when we plot it, lo and behold, it fits just right. So, okay, that's a fairly straightforward scenario. Uh, we may be interested in more complicated ones, right? So in particular, monoclonal antibodies, if, if we're worried about viral mutations, they may lose efficacy over time, in which case, one way that we would counteract that is potentially by increasing the dose frequency. So uh, given that in this case, we have these, these YTE mutated monoclonal antibodies with extraordinarily long half-lives, we would expect PK to accumulate if we're dosing it frequently. So uh, for instance, just to, to put this, to make this a bit more tangible, if we were dosing monthly for six months, uh, under the parameters that we have right now, then this is what we might expect. So in our first month, people are not reaching sufficient concentrations while later on they're reaching concentrations that are uh, in excess of what they need. So one way that we could counteract this is by introducing a loading dose. So let's phrase the problem instead as finding the three month dose uh, and a loading dose that maintains the therapeutic concentrations that we're looking for. 
for one year. And so again, we could iteratively go through and try different loading dose and repeated dose combinations. But now that we have this combination of two, that's going to be particularly painful to do, um, particularly when repeated. So same procedure as before, we define an objective function that is in terms of both the repeated dose and the loading dose. Uh, in this case, you might point out that there are actually many combinations of loading doses and repeated doses that are going to sustain target concentrations or concentrations above the IC90. And so this isn't actually a well-determined system because there, there are multiple solutions. Uh, so, and so we need to add on a second part here where we want to maintain therapeutic concentrations but we may also be interested in minimizing the total amount of medication administered. So it's a fairly intuitive thing that we would be interested in doing. We could pick something else, but this is enough to determine the system. So uh, we, again, can write down our objective function, which looks pretty similar to the one before. Uh, so this first part here is the total dose amount. We have K doses that are repeated plus a loading dose. So that's our total amount of medication that's given. And then here, we again have this distance between the 10th percentile uh, at, you know, whenever our time point is, or the, the minimum of it is sufficient to, to keep, um, to, to achieve the criteria, and, and the our IC90. And basically, we just want to set this lambda parameter high enough that it's going to penalize any deviation from that, so that when we optimize this, it will ensure that the 10th percentile is meet, meeting the IC90, and then can go and optimize the or minimize the total amount uh, done. There are a few ways that you could approach doing constrained optimization. This is this is one, but it, it may not. It, um, it, it, yeah, so you would set lambda to be sufficiently high that if your minimum concentration, you know, if uh, 41 is, you know, a deviation from one uh, of the IC90 of one is unacceptably high, then you set it such that, you know, lambda is a thousand or something. So that that turns into adding a thousand to your objective function. Yeah. Um, Again, different ways of approaching this, but this kind of fits the, the intuition that you want to force one part of the equation to be true, and then you can optimize the second part. Okay. Um, so when we do this, just as a, an aside, we typically want to optimize things in unbounded space. So we use log transformations or logit transformations in order to have our inputs be unbounded. So these are just uh, functions for transforming things in it. And then we would define our objective function again in terms of two doses. So we pass in our repeated dose and we pass in our loading dose. Um, we transform them back to the original scale. And then we again calculate the minimum of the, the predicted concentrations at the 10th percentile. And then we return the objective function that we had defined before, which is our total dose amount plus the weighted squared distance from the IC90. Okay. And so when we can optimize this and we find out that our uh, optimal dose that minimizes the total amount of medication given is a repeated dose of 413 every three months with a loading dose of 248 milligrams. And so when for a total dose of 1900 milligrams. And when we plot it, uh, this is what we get. So we we avoid successfully this issue of accumulation that would allow us, that would lead us to have too little or too much medication at different points. Okay. Just as a point of interest, it, I think is is interesting to note what it is that we're looking at, and so we can consider what this this objective function response surface looks like by looking at what the value of uh, doses around our optimal dose is going to give us at different points. So here we're just expanding the, the range of doses that we're going to look at away from, you know, up and down from our, our loading dose or from our optimal dose. And then we can calculate the objective function at each point, And we end up getting something that looks like this, right? And so 
what, what we're seeing here is this yellow line that passes through provides the combination of loading dose and repeated dose that will achieve the therapeutic concentration since that was the primary uh, weighted component of the objective function. Um, however, we also wanted to minimize the total amount given, and so that occurs at this flexion point here. And so clearly, if we move off of it in different directions, then, then we're going to start doing worse. Right. So this is our first criteria that we're interested in. For uh, any monoclonal antibody, we want to maintain concentrations sufficient to meet the IC90 um, against any circulating and historic variants. Uh, and we're going to calculate the dose required for 90% of the population. However, we are not ultimately interested just in PK, right? I mean, we want to know, is our monoclonal antibody going to prevent people from getting COVID? And for this, we need to introduce a PD model. Right? Um, okay, so here, just for... Uh, Context. So uh, I, I see 90 is an in vitro measurement that we typically have. It's frequently used with pseudovirus. It doesn't have to be, but it often is. Um, neutralizing antibodies or neutralizing antibody titers, uh, by contrast, is an in vivo measurement that is much closer to the gold standard of efficacy. Uh, and it's a measurement of the, yeah, the circulating antibodies effectiveness against live virus. And fortunately, this relationship has also been studied fairly well within the literature. So in particular, this group um, uh, by Cowrie and later by Sadler had done some work first demonstrating the relationship between neutralizing antibodies that were produced through vaccine trials to prevention of symptomatic COVID. And then in this second paper, they extended this to look at um, neutralizing antibodies as a result of monoclonal antibody trials too. And so we have this, this uh, literature that we can draw from here. And our general procedure that we're interested in is converting our monoclonal antibody concentrations to neutralizing antibodies and then to efficacy uh, using the data from the, the information from these trials. Neutralizing titers, so that this took me a bit to, to understand what they're doing, but the idea is that you take a sample of a person's blood and then you're going to serially dilute it and at each dilution measure how uh, much the virus is able to I guess, infect cells within this. And so intuitively, as you dilute the sample more and more, you're less likely to have, you're going to have lower concentrations of monoclonal antibodies and lower levels of effective uh, efficacy. And then they're going to compare it to what you would have in a control sample if you had just virus on its own. Um, and then from that, they will calculate the 50% neutralizing titer. And intuitively, there, there's this correspondence between IC50 and the neutralizing titer 50%, um, where if you have a something that needs to be diluted 10 times to get to the neutralize the 50 percent neutralizing titer then that is roughly 10 times the ic50 also so um, in theory it corresponds however this depends on the assay and is imprecise uh, so we when we make this conversion from monoclonal antibodies to neutralizing titers we want to know how much error we should be expecting in our measurements uh, and so for this we looked at these published findings from AstraZeneca for Evyshield, uh, where they had reported that there is a correspondence, the, the correspondence that they observed between, uh, I guess in this case, it was the uh, neutralizing titer 80% and IC80, but it's the same relationship, um, is that they tended to fall within 50 to 200% of the, the nominal value. So we can incorporate this into our PK model and start to, to build out the PD response. So here we have the neutralizing and or nominal neutralizing antibody titer is the concentration divided by the IC50. And we want to introduce variability into this IC50 parameter such that it matches the, uh, the relationship observed within the AstraZeneca trial. And so if we want to have roughly 95% falling between 50 and 200% of the nominal bounds, uh, 
then we want our uh, standard deviation to be 0.35. So it's just um, calculating it from the, the confidence bounds. And then after we have that, we want to convert the neutralizing antibodies to efficacy level. And specifically, we're looking at prevention of symptomatic COVID infection. And so here, this figure shows the relationship that was observed in the Cowrie paper between neutralization, uh, neutralizing titers and efficacy. And so this red line shows the response curve that they estimated from the vaccine trials, and the blue is from uh, monoclonal antibody trials. And so we're going to take a, a version of this blue one and implement this within our model. And they provide the equation associated with this, with the, the corresponding um, coefficients. And so then we can go and add this part within to our, into our model. And so here we have our efficacy that's being predicted uh, given the, the fold change in neutralizing antibodies. Then we can add these into our population so that we, we again have uh, something to simulate here. And this is the dose response, or sorry, the, um, the concentration response curve that we have. Um, um, after that, we would be interested in moving from dose response or do dose to directly to efficacy. And so again, in this, this case, we're also looking at a similar efficacy criteria as with the PK samples. We want to maintain 90% of the population above some target efficacy level. And so in this case, we are picking um, I mean, there's different efficacy levels, but somewhere in the range of 70 to 75 percent was what was initially reported for Evusheld. So we're, we're looking at trying to replicate something close to that. And so we can take a series of targets, though, say from 60 to 85 percent efficacy, and then apply the subjective function again to figure out what dose we need to sustain that efficacy within our, uh, within our population for 90% or more. And we get a dose response curve that tells us, okay, well, if we are interested in 60% efficacy, then just over one gram should be enough. Uh, for 75%, we're closer to two grams, right? Um, okay, finally, to wrap all of this up, we, uh, we put this into an application that could be shared easily with other people. We're anticipating needing to run through this a bunch of times. We're also anticipating questions coming in from other places. What, what if you did this? What if the viral um, uh, IC90 changed or you know, increased as a result of mutations at six months or something like that, uh, in which case, how does our what what how does our dose change? And so hopefully this works. Um, okay, right. So we can put in our parameters associated with the criterion. So we have PK or PD criterion that we're interested in because we've we've introduced two uh, relevant parameters of the PK and PD efficacy, such as the IC90, IC50, or the target efficacy in terms of some reduction in relative risk of symptomatic COVID. Um, and then, yeah, and, and so we can change these if we need. You know, if, if it looks like the IC90 increases, then we can increase it and then rerun it. Um, if it looks like, you know, certain, uh, if our dosing frequency decreases down to, let's say, 90 days, right, then we can go and rerun uh, it again and see, okay, well, now we needed, uh, we, we had the same issue with accumulation, and so we can introduce a loading dose. It'll take a little bit longer to run this time, but um, here we go. So then we find out that our dose in this scenario is 470 milligrams with a loading dose of 280. And similarly, we can look at this with the PD response. Where Again, we, we see this um, issue with accumulation and can add in loading dose. Um, 
Oops, there we go. So really, I, I mean, the, the, the benefit here is that we can put this tool in the hands of other people, I think. And it's, I mean, we can have quick turnaround times to answer questions that people have, but if someone else, it really gives someone else the ability to answer their own questions, I think, within certain bounds that we, we've determined are, are relevant. Um, okay, so yeah. Sure, okay. So when I think about loading dose, I think about maybe having a different dose, yes, but also maybe a different frequency as well, but that doesn't seem to be implemented here. It's just what the dose itself is for the first dose. And then it, you know, whatever your frequency is, it starts immediately after that. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, well, so right now it's, it's the first instance has the loading dose plus the regular dose, but yes, it, it is set up right now so that we only do it this one time loading dose to provide, to get people up to therapeutic concentrations. Uh, and then after that, you have a maintenance dose that, that maintains that, right? Um, there's no reason why you couldn't set it up to be a repeated loading dose or loading dose at certain time points. It, the implementation would be just the same as before, I think. You, you just just modify the objective function a little bit. So, um, yeah, I mean, if, if, if that's something that you'd, you'd be doing, but feel free to, to play around with it and, and try that out. Um, Okay, so to recap, because of the, the, the particularly the rapid mutation rate of COVID-19, we had some, some fairly unusual demands placed on us from a modeling standpoint. Specifically, we were interested in uh, develop, designing trials and coming up with answers in a very quick timeline. Uh, we also had limited prior data and we had limited ability to get that data from early phase trials before moving ahead. And we also needed to evaluate multiple candidates and scenarios. And so as part of PKPD, we first incorporated all the prior uh, data that we believed was relevant to the, the relationships. And then we streamlined the dose response relationship so that we could, or calculation so that we could quickly turn this around. Um, and so in general, again, we're, we're kind of the general approach is to find your efficacy term that you're interested in, in terms of the, the population variability, and then you optimize that criterion. And finally, we created this interface that we could share with people um, if necessary. Or, yeah. um, okay, thank you very much for your time. And I'd be happy to take any more questions. Hello. Thank you. Very, very interesting uh, session. And actually, Sam is a very, very good point because sometimes it's more interesting to play with the time than with the dose because in that way you can use the same dose, but for example, for the loading on the induction period instead of uh, six months, I think it was, maybe it's three months. Sure. And actually, my I have three questions. Um, the first one is related to that. So is, you know, this is a very simple optimization where you are only changing the, the dose and you just want the minimum dose that is going to reach the um, IC90 concentration at zero concentration after just a single dose. But sometimes we also have other factors that you can also incorporate in the uh, optimization function. Like for example, sometimes we have limitations from formulations. <laughs> or we'll have limitations from marketing or other things. Um, and also the second question that is also related with the first one is, did you think about maybe giving the dose subcutaneous instead of IV? Because if the only thing that you care is the zero concentration, then um, probably yes. it's better to use the subcutaneous administration. And then the last comment or question is, if you are losing efficacy because of the mutations, and you are defining efficacy like an Emax model, don't you think that the thing that is going to change is really Emax and not the um, EC50? So, sorry. And not the EC50. So, even if you increase the exposure, uh, your efficacy is going to be bad. Okay. Sorry. So, so yeah. bad. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll try to take this in, in turn. So, um, extra constraints such as 
uh, you know, amount of medication that being, can be given or so for, to start with, you know, these are being reported in tens of units. We don't really calculate doses in tens of units or, or uh, approved doses in that, you know. So for instance, if the, we can make it go up to 100, for instance, if that was part of it. Um, if there's some cost associated, so for instance, there are some costs associated with producing, uh, you know, three grams of medication for each dose that you're going to be giving. And so there, there is absolutely no reason that you couldn't incorporate that information also into your objective function to say we want to minimize, I mean, it could be minimize the cost of the medication given that it's going to meet these efficacy criteria, for instance, if that, if that was what was interested. The important point is just defining what it is that you want from this and then optimizing that, that quantity. Um, second question, subcutaneous, right? We did look at subcutaneous. Uh, so so the, this is a implementation of the app for, for the presentation and um, the version that we'd originally developed, we were looking at subcutaneous also. Uh, the bioavailability for monoclonal antibodies with subcutaneous dosing is around 50%, we think, right? And um, given it, so that, I mean, that, that really depends on the frequency in which people are coming into the clinic and or are going to be receiving medications um, and, and how effective any specific antibody is to make, see whether or not that's possible. That is something we are interested in. In this case, a lot of the patients that we're looking at treating with this are immunocompromised who may be that way because they are receiving treatment or chemotherapy or something like that, for instance. And so the belief going into this was that, uh, and, and also as a result of, I think, speaking to patients in, in clinics, is that they would not be averse to IV treatment centers uh, in order to receive the medications if it came with a, a six month dosing timeline, for instance. And so um, the primary focus was on IV, although subcutaneous was evaluated. Um, final point, the maximum efficacy. Again, I think if, if there is evidence that uh, when when monoclonal antibodies lose efficacy in response to viral mutations, that this changes the maximum effect, then there's, I mean, we could absolutely incorporate that in too. I, I don't have the information to speak to whether or not that's how, how plausible that is. Certainly in, um, in the references and literature that I've have been looking at, efficacy or changes in efficacy are primarily measured in terms of shifting IC50. Um, and within the um, the Cowrie paper, yeah, I I don't know. I, I that I'm not sure. I don't know enough about the pharmacopoeia. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, the question was if. If monoclonal antibodies are losing efficacy due to viral mutations, would this impact the Emax or Imax rather than the IC50, for instance? Which, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I think that that's a reasonable hypothesis. Um, that's that's not how I, I I think it's been traditionally modeled, but but it seems like it could be the case. Um, if that is the case, then then we certainly could. To incorporate that too. Thank you, Ryan. Um, quick question about uh, uh, understanding your model predictions uh, um, outcome, right? So you used AstraZeneca data, and uh, did you guys also consider the molecules you're developing in terms of uh, some in vitro or animal comparison in terms of the neutralizing antibody, the, the titer, right? Affinity, abundance, because we know the uh, Hyder is really an integrated readout for that, right? How does this incorporate the molecule-specific differences, right? Comparing yours versus AstraZeneca in order for you to make some model improvement as well as understanding the clinical outcome. Yeah, so, I mean, this, this specifically doesn't. I, I mean, we're, we're looking at, I think that my understanding, again, it's not, not really my area of expertise, but and that this is more a characteristic of the specific assay and how well it is able to uh, 
correspond between the IC50 and the neutralizing titer 50%. And so, you know, we would speak to the, the people more directly involved in this to figure out what they think the performance is of their machine. Um, in this case, we've benchmarked it to the AstraZeneca data in absence of more clear data from our own labs. But um, so I'll say one of the, the advantages of setting up, and really the, yeah, part of the goal of setting up the, the model like this is that we have various different parts. You know, we have our uh, the PK component, then we also have the conversion to neutralizing titers, and then from neutralizing titers, we have the movement to uh, efficacy, clinical efficacy. And so when we're running a, a trial, we're going to get these measurements at very different rates. The PK and neutralizing titers can be collected relatively quickly. There is some issue with you know, collecting sufficient PK samples to characterize the, the clearance because it has such a long clearance. But generally speaking, these are going to accumulate much faster than instances of symptomatic COVID uh, from people who have been habitually avoiding uh, going out, you know, for instance. So, um, so the, the, the goal there is that w when we, we would collect each of these, uh, these aspects of it, and then once we have the data for each of the components, we could update those components within the model and, and leave the parts that, you know, so for instance, if the, the clinical outcomes are going to take longer to accumulate, then we can update everything that we possibly can before then, at least, and try to get a, a, a you know, initial approval prior to that based on the data available. Yeah, thank you for a very uh, in, interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering, you know, given that you have about, as far as I know, at least between 1 billion and 100 billion viral copies at peak infection time, you know, how stringent, or is the IC50 or IC80 estimate, or IC90 estimate, are they stringent enough? Or um, should there be more stringent? How, how do you mean stringent? Uh, like so, so why, why not? Then? Why not? An, an, you know, so if you have an, 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 an IC50, that basically means it takes you from, let's say, 10 billion copies to mm. 5 billion copies. That's still like sure. a lot of virus. Oh, yeah. So uh, should the, an IC99, for example, you know, be used? We, uh, that is possible. I, I think within the prior Lilly efforts, we had looked at 90% above IC90 and mm -hmm. uh, had good efficacy measurements, I think, with that. But I, certainly, again, again, I think that's that's a reasonable question that, you know, w w if we wanted to make this the IC95, for instance, how much does that change our dose? Mm -hmm. uh, in which case, we would want to be able to, to evaluate that quite quickly. But the, I think that the broader point there is that we don't, I don't know, I mean, the, the direct correspondence between the IC50, IC90, IC99, and the things that we actually care about isn't, isn't there, right? I, I can't tell you off the top of my head if IC95, how much better that is than the IC90. Uh, but linking that to a PD response model, for instance, allows us to optimize things in terms of this the the uh, measurement that we ultimately are interested in that we can have a dose that maintains efficacy according to multiple criterion yeah. we, we we could actually go and figure out you know what what ic90 or what what ic value corresponds to each level of efficacy too if we wanted and so we could have that direct correspondence but yeah. so so second question is that my understanding of covid is that you know part of the problem is that you know even if you have like viral particles floating around after an acute infections that are no longer infectious you basically your immune system is so wound up that you know they call in the cavalry if you will like all the time and that leads then to an overshoot of immune response which ultimately kills the patients through organ failure for example mm -hmm. um so have you any chance to Consider this in your model, so let's say what the level of immune response is uh, prior to, um, you know, anybody dosing versus not. So uh, you think about the, the innate immune response rather. So to some degree, I think that was l waved away a little bit because, I mean, the target population is primarily immunocompromised who are going to have a reduced immune response, but that's not to say that it's non-existent and they're there's certainly, you know, were discussions about trying to figure out what, 
it, it, identifying the neutralizing titers that are coming from the exogenous antibodies versus any innate immune response is not, from what I understand, a, a really trivial thing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Dr. Jarrett. Okay.